I am really curious what sets of logic gates are used to ensure that the lights cycle in the expected way. Okay, so the intent is that each second a different group of lights come on. Each group should come on within seconds 1 to 5. Zero index, so counting zero as one second. So all I need to do is hook up the clock output to each equals comparator and each number to the relevant equals comparator and then each equals comparator to a different four-way splitter. I think that's it. Wait, I have five outputs and there are only four splitter inputs. Okay, screw the number zero and let's focus on one through four. I mean, technically if I use zero, lights will turn on before the widget starts and maybe I don't actually want that. Of course, if you used modulo from the stopwatch or reset it after four seconds and embrace zero, you could have the marque do its marque thing indefinitely. Well, resetting would work better. Modulo would mean eventually the stopwatch would hit a maximum and the widget would break. Wait, I saw a hand counting behind that magic. Wait, is this just making sure at least four inputs come in from... Oh, fine. Not a complex gate system after all. Another test of my ability to do arithmetic in my head. You know, I'm kind of actually bad with those. The stress of looking dumb despite everything else I know I know I'm capable of. My self-doubt at any answer that comes to me and the need to recheck many times and the fear of looking stupid in front of others and possibly becoming an exemplar for a stereotype with my failures makes stuff like this really difficult for me to do. Time zero. Well, that's easy. Zero. Another time zero. Wait, why is this stopwatch not starting? Oh, there are missing connections on the widget. Shouldn't be too difficult to fill in the missing pieces. The random ball selection needs to feed into the splitter. At least one of these needs to feed into the stopwatch to start the process. The AND gate needs a positive signal, so I need to connect the stopwatch and the 60 marker up. Technically, if I am more interested in taking my time and patience, I could cross-connect the expectations and have the timer be the top input and the 60 be the bottom input. This would mean that it is 60 that must be less than or equal to the stopwatch, so I must wait a minute instead of only having a minute. And if I don't connect up the system that resets the stopwatch, I can bypass the entire time section of this. No way, the random ball selection is controlled by the metronome. I still have a limited amount of time per question, but I have a lot more leeway in waiting for easy questions if I need to. Anyway, the total control must be connected for whenever I get the right answer, and the bottom part needs to be connected to the equality check below. I really wish that there was a greater than or equal to, because what if I am so fast I go from 5 to 7 and skip 6? Well, that actually is a concern. With the stopwatch as it is, if I answer 7 or more correctly in this time span, when the stopwatch is unlocked, then having many too many questions answered will kill the AND gate. Oh, one more thing. If I get an answer quickly, I could press the enter button on that calculator multiple times. The randomization occurs in the metronome, so a correct answer isn't going to reset the question. I'm not showing off mental math skills. I am showing off my nefarious plans for breaking stuff. Now time to wait a minute. In the meantime, I can't answer anything else. Well, the numbers aren't too high. This isn't actually that difficult if I wanted to do it legit. I don't, though. Part of the fun of these puzzles is lateral thinking for me. Hey, that's the ultimate question of life, the universe, and ah, too late. We are introduced to a new control. Not sure why I'm given two equality controls in addition to the one I already have, but I would need a splitter anyway. Good, I have one available. It says tails initially since this widget hasn't started yet, but what this does is it represents a boolean true or false. And like the random number generator ball controls from earlier, those pick a number from a certain range. This picks a number between zero and one, since a coin only has two sides. Well, only two sides worthy of any consideration before anyone gets on my case about the sodding edge. Heads is true, tails is false. Heads is one, tails is zero. Which makes sense since humans still have heads, but we've lost our tails. Hmm, interesting. Well, I would expect it to be at least pseudo-random and, and differently seeded each time so that it is for all intents and purposes random. 
Of course, as being a kid's game, first and foremost, I don't expect they take the time to design a secure random number generator. Technically, it is possible to predict the numbers from a random number generator if you can figure out the algorithm and the seed, which could be an issue when randomness is needed for information security, but we're here for funneled Mac games, not dissertations into computer security. This will keep flipping the coin. This will direct the output to one of two totals based on whether the output is one or zero, heads or tails. Technically, I could just connect one because one side would come up to 100 eventually and 100 plus zero is 100 and it looks like the question mark box only cares about the total, but unlike the last puzzle, I actually care about the results here. Hmm, that one total for tails appeared before the first flip. I think it took the initial not flipped yet, zero, to mean tails flip zero. If only we had an enum, like not flipped tails and heads. This is really slow. Well, time for a break. And it's finally done. It goes without saying that it won't be an even 50-50 split. Random is, after all, random. Even with Tails at Head Start. Ah, uh, the Gravity Chamber. We used this when I was first showing off the game. So, on when falling, and on when it hits. Well, I can easily just stick the A switch and smack it twice, since it'll increment the counter by 2, and 2 plus 0 is 2. Feel free to check my math, but I've got a good feeling about this calculation. But that just feels so incredibly unsporting compared to the other ways I broke things. And I wouldn't get to drop another elephant. I like dropping elephants. In case anyone is wondering, I love the acne switch because it makes me feel like every puzzle is a nefarious plan to catch the roadrunner. Or in this case, an elephant. Now this is quite similar to something else I made, but uses fewer parts. Whenever the rails change, it forwards the connected signal. So if the rail change forwards a signal that causes the rail to change, which forwards a signal that causes the rail to change, which forwards a signal that causes the rail to change, and the rails changing is not on a timer, then, as the good doc says over there, it is essentially only limited by your processor speed. On one hand, my sheep shaver emulator will be slower than a non-emulated machine. On the other, my machine is so fast that it probably shouldn't matter too much. By default, the top is what takes a signal, so we start there. The real logic for the top switch is the, with the false signal. It starts at the top, the true signal it is at the bottom. So when this rail gets a true pass through it, it swaps the rail. This means it now gets a false signal, which is enough to swap it right back. More compact than my clock method, but at least that method I discovered on my own. So, like, there. Another elephant fall. I love these, Doc. Why can't you like these as much as you like light bulbs everywhere? The only difference between my initial usage of this and now is we are told exactly what height. And like there, we will have a stopwatch that start stops as the elephant falls. Let's hope I have the parts. Oh no! My acne switch! Why must you limit me to such an inferior input system? Why must bad things happen to evil people? Huh? I already have number inputs. Speaking of which, it just occurred to me that I could very quickly cycle through numbers to guess the value without actually building the widget. I won't do that, so don't worry. Okay, basics. Clicking starts the watch, drops the elephant. Elephant falls, and then the watch stops. And then that's all she wrote. Why do I feel like I'm forgetting something? Elephant sure is falling fast for the moon. Oh, right. There we go. On the plus side, I got to drop two elephants. Make 
the cow moo? But lacking that, I'll have to use this damn mess. So the distance mouse mover calculates an average, and once that average goes above 100, it toggles an AND gate. The second trigger for that AND gate is to smacking the A 30 times. Once the first two are unlocked, it waits for an input from C. That doesn't lock a true signal. I have to hold C or press it when everything else is set. I have 23 seconds to send a signal to the rail system before the track changes. Go crazy with the mouse, then go crazy with it, and then slam C at the very end. I let go of the A key, why is it still pressed? So, I'd like to file a bug report. Basically, holding down the mouse button interferes with the key press and that any keys depressed do not properly resume being undepressed, even when the respective key is released. Guess I'll have to unparalyze my stream of actions and perform them sequentially to avoid this race condition. Um, I can't see how the system works. How the heck am I supposed to reverse engineer it? Doc says that if you press the right two keys at a time, three times in a row, you can turn the locks off. Okay, we are on the home row here with the ASDFGH. Okay, so there are six choices. We choose two of them. Formula for combinations is the number of elements factorial over the number of picks of those elements factorial. Finally, times leftover elements factorial. Only 15. Not too difficult to figure out manually either. H, D, H, S, H, A, H, F, H, G, then go to D, and remember that D, H is the same as H, D, as this is a combination, not a permutation, so it ends up being five choices for H, then only four more unique choices for D, etc., making five plus four plus three plus two plus one situation, which is also 15, so yay. So I only have 15 combinations, really, try three times in a row. Or I can smash things randomly until it works, because somehow I find that that works. Keep your hands on home row and then just go crazy. Astrological signs? Astrology? Doc, the correct term is astronomy. Come on, you're a scientist. Anyway, I need something to set the TV channel. First, slight detour about the TV. First, if you're if you're, if you're very young, um, TVs were these really old boxes that were gigantic, huge cathode ray tubes. They, they fired out I don't actually know how they worked off the top of my head, but the point is they showed images of, of stuff, of whatever you want to watch. And if you want to watch something, you'd have to set the channel to that and then hope that you timed it right on the hour, no matter how busy you were, or you'd have to use a VHS tape to tape it for later. And and then you'd have you interrupted with commercials all the time. It was, it was, be thankful you have on-demand video these days. You kids have it so easy. These are basically mapping numbers to some pretty picture of some kind. The images are part of the game itself, but using different number inputs can control which picture appears. Let's see what they all look like. The slider widget is odd. I set it to min-max range where each phase of the moon image exists, but it wants to add decimals to the sliding. Whatever, it still works. When the integer value is changed, it changes the channel, so to speak. There are six different kinds of things to display. The first are phases of the moon, also known as astronomy. The next are part of the stupid what's your sign pickup line, which to me is a sign that I'm done with the conversation. Next are ESP things. If you are hoping to take up James Randy's million dollar reward, this is the TV for you. I will tell your fortune. Or maybe not. This one's off state looks different from the others. Like those old countdown things on those old television things. Things, thingy things. Anyway, the number zero is off. The number one is zero. The number two is one. It goes on like that until it gets to 10, which is nine. You may ask, what is going on here? First of all, there is a second option I neglected to mention. 
the bottom asks for display choices once through set or wrap around set. If you've watched enough of me already, you've probably heard the phrase modulo arithmetic. Either that or you've studied mathematics at some point in your life. Well, that's what wrap around set means. Ignoring zero, which always means off and never technically repeats. Then the number right after the last one that would otherwise show the last graphic then shows the first graphic. So a non-zero number will always show a graphic, making it possible for an ever-increasing number to loop. And combined with my fast counter from earlier, this makes Rockstar TV. If Flor Hansen had banged like that, I'd be very concerned. I'm already terrified about her neck whenever she does that on stage. Oh, also this reveals that even after the counter widget breaks, the constant changing of the TV still shows that internally. It is still counting, even if it cannot display the proper number. Right, now that you understand the slider control in the TV, back to Doc's astrological nightmare. So now that we know how the TV works, we still don't know how to solve the puzzle. Because it requires knowledge outside of the game to know what sign the lion is. As I mentioned in the video description for the time-lapse puzzle with the bird feathers, I really want puzzle solutions to be derivable based on what's in the game, unless it's common knowledge. Unfortunately, I don't consider astrological signs common knowledge, and also, unfortunately, I happen to know that the lion is Leo. The only other one I know off the top of my head is Bull for Taurus. Save me, Acme Dynamite. How many Earths? Like parallel Earths? Or how many Earths could fit inside Neptune? Okay, this makes use of the solar system widget. These widgets are actually quite simple. Don't be deceived by all the different settings. You select a planet, and then what property of the planet you want to output. Basically, it's, it's a glorified set of constants representing some property of a planet, making it easier and prettier to make calculations based on stuff about them. In this case, we want to know how many Earths fit inside Neptune. Well, how much of thing A can go into thing B is a division operation. But first, let's see what we are dividing. Of all the options, diameter is the only one that really gives us a physical size of some kind to work with, but that's not enough. What we want is volume. The volume of Neptune and the volume of the Earth, since that calculation deals with the amount of space they take up. Now the calculation will be a bit fudgy. After all, if you physically wanted to fit Earths into Neptune, you're going to have empty space around all the spheres, so you can't make use of all of the volume of Neptune. But I'm going to assume and hope the widget doesn't care about that, because otherwise I'm going to have to phone my friend and ask her to spend some time on this problem. If nothing else dates this game, calling Pluto a planet certainly does. Thankfully, we have some parts that take the equations for certain things, such as sphere volume, and turn them into a single part that just needs to take inputs acting as a substitution of the variables of the actual equation and then throw out an answer. We select what shape we are dealing with, either 2D or 3D for area and volume respectively. We want the volume of a sphere. And what do you know? That's what we have already. Selected. Good. Now we can... Wait. Length of radius. This is why you always read documentation. This expects a radius, but the part we have generates a diameter. The diameter line goes through the center of the sphere from one part of the sphere all the way to the other side. The radius is half that. So that's why I had those other two controls earlier for number inputs. These need to be set to two. And now I need... So two divisors convert each planet's diameter to a radius. The last divisor will take the volume calculations and divide the larger value, Neptune, by the smaller value, Earth, and then that feeds to the int control to undecimalize it since you can't fit part of an Earth, at least ignoring the fact you're already wasting a lot of space between Earths if you did this for real. And then that answer is piped into the question mark box and then we get our one up. over the divisor is because at this moment it is attempting to divide by zero. Don't worry, once the numbers are processed, that error will pass. Okay, 55 Earths, somewhat. Not accounting for empty space volume or the fact that planets aren't exactly, specifically, perfectly spherical. So I messed it up, huh? I wonder who that could have been. So, quick rundown, he wants a different animal sound every 15 seconds. 
May my ears forgive me. There are four number inputs set 1, 16, 31, 46. If you correct for the fact that starting at zero is like so totally better, that would mean 0, 15, 30, and 45. In other words, second markers for each different 15 second mark on the seconds. First, some organization. So I cannot move or change the top left clock, the four splitter, or the number inputs. I would hazard a guess that since each number input is testing a second time frame to determine when a sound should go through, it must act as the tester for an equality comparison. So each number should go to an equality comparator. But what are we comparing? Since it's the only thing that makes sense, I'm going to hazard a guess at the top left control I cannot double click on, and by hazard a guess I mean open it up in another new widget to see how it works, that it is set to output the seconds only. That control, by the way, is automatically set based on the computer time. So if I connect it to the four splitter, then I can send the seconds output to the four comparators. I can also make the wiring nicer, but it's annoying and tedious to do, so I won't. Now, what order do I want the animals in? Wait, I can't connect to the sound. I need to use the two splitters. The thing is, if I want the question mark box to activate, I need to send true signals to each of those two bottom and gate parts. An equality check will be a pulse, not a continuous signal. So that's where the total controls come in. I'll start by connecting the animals first. And now the totals. I will start this on the minute turnover. Hey, you get to see when I record this. Eagle Eyes will have noticed by now the clocking got first-hand peeks at all the cuts I do in post-production every time the clock seemed to oddly change. Even better Eagle Eyes may have spotted that I named one of my desktop folders something silly to mess with people. Other eagle-eyed viewers will have probably screenshotted every chance they've seen my Mac desktop, recorded the games they saw, and are making bets which ones, if any, I'll ever let's play. Or at least, finish. What was I doing? Right. Waiting for the right time to hit go. What? No! The question mark end game thingy didn't... I wasn't... Ugh. The rooster wasn't heard! Okay, you want to be like that, huh? I'll start immediately after the minute changes for the rooster, but first... We will build up a cacophony. My nefarious plans! You may be thinking, when's Erica going to add a cut to the video? You keep thinking that hope, even false hope, is always helpful to escape hell. If that doesn't get docked up, I don't know what will. Poor cat didn't have a chance the last round. Hey, let's go again that entire thing, but put the cat earlier. And a nice easy one to round everything out. Each one of those messages on the top right sorta of combines the TV concept of a number mapping to something else, with the billboard concept of showing text on a signal. A zero or false shows nothing. One to four show a line of text. That, if this widget were something I made and not a puzzle, would be configurable. So, you can have different messages in the same control based on input. Likely situation here, each of those put together would make one sentence of the poem, and the random number generator balls are choosing between one and four for each section. Each run of randomizing all four gives one sentence to the poem. After it has gone through five times, it exits. Of course, I need to connect everything up first. This is a repeating loop, and the best representation of a for loop in Widget Workshop is a stopwatch that resets after a certain period of time. Every four seconds, this will trigger the randomization, as well as flip the toggle, which both sends a signal to the end and gate, so our solution can actually open the box, and to reset the stopwatch to let it go again. Regardless of what numbers are chosen, each time they generate a non-zero value, 
A one signal is sent through the AND gate heading towards the total, which counts how many sentences this has written. Hmm. These poems are odd. Let's make another poem. Wait, what? That sounds familiar. I can't quite put my finger on it. I think someone messed with this widget when I wasn't looking. Oh well. 